Hello, good evening everyone. Uh, I'm Michelle Batty and I'm the manager of the European Reference Network that's called Eurogen. Um, it deals with rare urogenital diseases and complex conditions. It was created by the European Commission in 2017 and we're one of 24 such networks. Um, what our main activities are is we provide virtual consultations cross-border so any doctor working in any hospital in the EU can uh, contact us and ask for a case discussion if that would be helpful and that's a service that's free. Um, we also collaborate in education and training activities like this webinar series and we also have a clinical exchange programme. We also have a registry as well and that's going live just now being rolled out to our healthcare providers. Um, we're currently a network of 57 hospitals. Uh, without further ado then, I won't take any more time. Uh, if you're interested in any of uh, what we do or how to contact us, please visit our website. Um, and this evening's webinar is about primary obstructive mega ureter, uh, treatment options and long-term results. And we're absolutely delighted uh, to have our colleagues from the University Hospital at Padova in Italy. And tonight we have uh, Alessandro Molacco, and uh, he's Assistant Pre Professor of Urology there, and Mariangela Mancini, who is Consultant Urological Surgeon also at Padova. Uh, so Mariangela and Alessandro, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us this evening, and we really look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Michelle. Good afternoon. So my name is Mariangela Mancini. Um, I'm a urologist working at the Urological Clinic in Padova, Italy. And I'm uh, here today sharing this uh, presentation with uh, my colleague, Alessandro Morlacco. Uh, I just would like to say uh, before we start that it was a honor for me and a pleasure to make a presentation at the last EAU meeting in Amsterdam in the e-Eurogen session, on, uh, which was basically an update on uh, rare and complex urology and our activities in the last year. And it was really nice to be there together uh, after a long time, and um, especially with Michelle, with uh, Vautfeit, and with my co-presenters, Magdalena Fossum, Giovanni Mosiello, Hans Langerhausen, and also for the very first time some patients and um, I think it was uh, great to see these patients with rare conditions, adult, adult patients involved in activities and some of them even involved in the guidelines uh, group for penile cancer and I think this is really great that we are enriched by patients and um, by their point of view on diseases and, um, and by their involvement. And I think this is a very nice of Eurogen to have patients involved. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk uh, with Alessandro on primary obstructive mega ureter. And uh, in particular, we will focus on the available evidence on treatment options and long term results. You can go on with the slides. Okay, so. Uh, this is um, the, the logo, the new logo for the pediatric urology world in our uh, clinic. Uh, I just would like to say that um, the uh, pediatric beds are in the same clinic um, and the staff, the urology staff and the residents are involved in the treatment of uh, uh, children and adults. And, um, um, and this is historically, this has been so in our clinic. And uh, there are dedicated urologists um, to, to children, but the beds are in the same, in the same words, in separate rooms, uh, but in the, same, in the same building, in the same floor. Um, and Alessandro uh, Morlaco is uh, taking care at the moment uh, 
of the children with uh, urological pediatric conditions. And um, I would like to take this opportunity today also to introduce him as a new member of the e-Eurogen uh, group. And he will be um, involved um, mostly in Workstream 1 activities, but he is also involved in uh, Workstream 2 and 3 uh, together with me and also involved in uh, the data collection that we do every six months. And so it, it is a pleasure for me to introduce him and he, he will join us in the work with the Eurojet. I also would like to say the last thing that you see here in this slide that uh, our medical school, which is the oldest in the world, is celebrating this year 800 years <clears throat> since its foundation in, in 1222. So this is a very special year for us. And, uh, and we are proud to present uh, during this year also this webinar uh, in the e-Eurogen series. Of course, we have no conflict of interest. Okay, you can go, Alessandro. Okay, so I just give you a brief uh, summary on the main points of uh, the presentation that Ale Alessandro will uh, do for most of it. Um, uh, we have divided it in, in four uh, sections. So at the beginning, we will say we will say the definition: what is primary obstructive mega ureter and how uh, you, it is diagnosed. Then we will talk about treatment options and also um, a conservative options or, or options of, uh, in which we can um, avoid or delay uh, active surgical treatment and, and, and we will see when this is possible and, and how. We will talk about the outcomes and uh, also long-term outcomes. And, and here I would like to say that we are starting now an accurate uh, data collection of all our experience in the past uh, with a long-term follow-up. And, uh, and this work is not completed yet, but we would be happy to share the data of our uh, clinic in the next webinar in the next months when they will be ready. So this work is going on right now. We would also talk um, and discuss the opportunity of uh, um, choose um, non-surgical treatment, for example, endoscopic dilation. What is the available evidence on this technique and what is the, the follow-up? And uh, at the end, we will give also some, uh, some take-home messages on, uh, on, on this, uh, on what we have discussed in the webinar. So from this point on, I, I will leave uh, the, the presentation to, to Alessandro, okay? Please, Alessandro. Okay, thank you, Mariangela. Thank you to the Eurogen uh, members and uh, staff for this uh, very nice opportunity to present uh, this afternoon. Thank you all. So uh, let's start from the beginning. So how do we define a uh, primitive obstructive mega ureter? And let's start from the statement of the British Association of Pediatric Urologists saying that, first of all, you need to have a dilatation dilation of the distal ureter. So uh, the diameter of the distal ureter at the ultrasound scan should be more than uh, uh, seven millimeters. You should have no reflex at the cystogram and you should have an obstructive pattern at the MAG-free renal scan. So th these are the three main, uh, uh, main issues. Uh, as far as classification is concerned, we mainly use the fister Hendren classification. That is a morphological classification that uh, is coming from the past, obviously, but uh, is something we can use also today. So in type 1, we have only a dilation of the distal ureter without dilation of the pelvis and calyces. In type 2, you have a dilation of the ureter and hydronephrosis, a dilation of the pelvis. And in type 3, you have a severe hydroureter nephrosis, so dilation of the whole collecting system with the tortuous ureter. And this is what mainly we see in the surgical practice today. So as far as prenatal diagnosis is concerned, this is a, still a critical issue because uh, the detection of a dilated ureter is not so easy. So it's pretty easy 
with the scans, with the machines we have today to detect the, the dilation of the pelvis, but the dilation of the ureter is much more difficult. And also there is no mm, convincing evidence of a, co of a clear correlation between the prenatal finding and the postnatal outcome. But what we know obviously is that if you find a, a ureter dilation in the prenatal phase more than seven millimeters, you should do something more after. What is the, the thing you should do? Well, the first thing we do is to take a postnatal ultrasound scan. So you all know that we usually don't do that in the first or second day after the birth because of the dehydration, so the risk of uh, underestimating the dilation. So we usually wait until three to six days and then uh, you do the ultrasound scan. And then you go uh, based on uh, the uh, findings. So if you have a no dilation, which can be frequent, you recheck the children usually after four weeks. And this is meant to be uh, a, a way to uh, improve the diagnostic power so to, um, to, to reduce the risk of uh, underdiagnosis, okay? If you have a bilateral dilation, you are in a pretty urgent situation. So you need to understand if you have a, a bilateral reflex, which is much less severe, okay? If you have uh, a, a infravesical obstruction, which could be a posterior ureteral valve, which is rather urgent, or you can also have uh, an obstructive bilateral mega ureter. So what we do usually in this situation, this setting, is to take an urgent uh, voiding ureter cystogram. Okay, and if you are in the most common situations, uh, meaning that you have a monolateral dilation. What we usually do is to do an ultrasound after four weeks, then to obtain if the dilation is confirmed, obviously, uh, you do avoiding uh, ureterocystogram. And then if you have done the diagnosis of dilation, you have ruled out a vesicle, uh, a renal vesicle reflex, okay? And also you have ruled out a posterior ureteral valve, you do uh, the third exam, which is the dynamic mag free scan. So the uh, ureterocystogram can show obviously a, a vesical, vesical renal reflex, okay, which can be present in more than 25% of cases. You can also uh, find in some, in some patients a posterior ureter bulb, bulb, which as you know, can also present uh, with a monolateral hydroureteral nephrosis. You can find a ureter seal, you can find a, a bladder diverticulum, you can also find signs of a neurogenic bladder. And as I've told you, the, uh, the only uh, real urgent setting is that uh, of a bilateral dilation. As far as renal scan is concerned, uh, we all know that the uh, appropriate scan, the appropriate uh, uh, exam in this setting is mag free today. So uh, this is the pharmaceutical agent and uh, uh, you need to have uh, a diuretic uh, stimulus. Okay, so mug free plus diuretic. This is a typical monolateral case. So you can see in the left side, uh, you have uh, a dilated ureter and you see that the dilation of the ureter and the stasis of the, the radioactive urine does not resolve after sometimes after having the child sitting and standing and also after maturation. And this is confirmed by the curves you see here. This is a typical renal scan of a bilateral mega ureter. So this is an infant, uh, two to three months children, male, child. And uh, you can see here that uh, uh, you find a bilateral dilated ureter, but on the right side, uh, the situation is uh, less severe because yes, you have the dilation. Yes, you can visualize all the ureter during the scan, 
but you can see at the end of the exam, the uh, stasis of the urine is shown. While on the left side, you have a marked hydrourethral nephrosis with a highly tortuous ureter, which does not result, which does not improve after uh, standing and after micturition. And this is confirmed by the curves you see here. So I don't want to get into uh, details here, but if you will have uh, some questions, we'll, we'll be more than happy to, to take the questions afterwards. So the central problem here is how do we define obstruction? And this is strictly connected with the clinical question. The clinical question is who should be treated, okay? So we are still using today the old definition of cough that says that uh, an obstruction is a restriction to urinary outflow that when left untreated will cause progressive renal deterioration. And so we can flip the question and ask who should be treated? Well, you should treat the guys who have an obstruction. How do we define obstruction? Um, here there is an agreement that comes uh, uh, again from the British Pediatric Urology Association. And so these are the most accepted. <laughs> these are not the only one, okay? Not the, the only possible indication for, treat, for, for treatment, but the, the, these are for, for sure the most uh, common. So an initial different function less than 40%. Second, if you do as we do uh, usually in this patient, repeated scans, a worsening of renal function more than 5 to 10%. There is no agreement on that. For sure, 5% is a more conservative choice. So if you have a function that, uh, say, is uh, 50% one scan, you do another scan after three or six months, you have, uh, let's say, 43%. This can always be an indication for treatment. And obviously, another one is the worsening dilation at ultrasound follow-up. So these patients need to be closely followed after three months and then another three months and then six months and so on. And if you see the worsening of the dilation, this could be an uh, indication for treatment. Okay, so which treatment? The first, the first form of treatment is non-operative management. Non-operative management uh, involves prenatal and postnatal counseling to the family. So you need to explain them, them what is the problem that the child has and uh, how the follow-up uh, will be and uh, when we will decide for uh, an, active, uh, an active treatment. And then you place the, the child on a clinical and instrumental follow-up. And the, so the follow-up is done mainly by the ultrasound, but also there is a role for repeated renal scans. And the other aspect is a continuous antibiotic prophylaxis, which is uh, advised for the first 12 months. And it has been seen that 85% of child with uh, uh, obstructive mega ureter goes to a spontaneous resolu resolution. So this is a very high rate. And so this is why non-operative management is the first, uh, the first choice in this setting. So we have a study here, pretty recent study, showing how it goes with spontaneous uh, resolution. resolution. Uh, so uh, they, they analyzed 101 patients. Uh, the, 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 the average age at the baseline was uh, two months. The follow-up uh, was about 29 months, and uh, the uh, main inclusion uh, criteria was uh, the presence of a distal ureter more than seven millimeters. And so you can see that the only real uh, risk factors for surgical intervention you can see here are the presence of uh, UTIs, 
or the presence of a ureteral dilation greater than uh, 14 millimeters, okay? These are the only elements uh, which reach the statistical significance here. And while on the, on the right, if you see uh, the uni univariate and multivariable analysis uh, uh, involving the risk factors for spontaneous resolution, resolution you can see that uh, the only significant factors was a dilation more than uh, 11 millimeters. You can see the same the same concept here. So this is a survival analysis, and you can see how a patient who have a dilation uh, smaller than uh, 11 millimeters go to a greater spontaneous resolution when compared with uh, child who have uh, children who have uh, a dilation more than 11 millimeters. The other question is how long should conservative treatment or non-treatment be? So we know from the literature that the majority of cases who require surgery uh, do so in the first two years of life. But there is a but here, and the but is clarified in this in this study. So this uh, this is a, not a new study. This is uh, from uh, 15 years ago, okay, which was published in the Journal of Urology. And the problem here is that, that they followed 40 children with the primary obstructing mega ureter and they followed it, they followed them until adolescent and adult. And you can see here, this is a survival analysis again. You can see how the uh, resolution, the spontaneous resolution of uh, hydronephrosis is certainly greater during the first two years of life. But you can see here, you can have, you can still have resolution of uh, hydronephrosis after 60, 70, 80, even 100 months. Okay, so the take home message from this study is that if you choose to do a conservative treatment, the follow up should be extended until adult age. Same concept here. This is a more uh, recent study. It is from uh, 2013. They included uh, they included the patient with a distal ureter seven millimeter or greater, as always, and they followed them for a medium period of ten years. And you can see here they started from uh, a group of 88 uh, primary mega ureters. They operated right afterwards on 14 patients and they choose to observe the majority of them as it is. So 74 went to observation and they ended up with 54 of these patients never touched, okay? While 20 patients underwent surgical, uh, surgical management during the follow-up. And they saw how uh, this for these 54 patients divided into two groups. So the improved patient were seven and the completed result were the majority. So 45, 47 patients. You can see here that the probability of resolution is obviously greater in the surgery group, meaning that if you choose to do surgery the, the surgical solution will, will, will take place for probably during the first years of, uh, of age. While in the observational group, they saw a slow improvement of uh, hydronephrosis in many patients. And so here again, the concept is that you need to follow up uh, for a long time these patients. And they also try to analyze uh, uh, and to find uh, any uh, predictors of spontaneous uh, resolution. And they didn't find much actually. The, the only significant finding uh, were the, the excretory pattern. So if the patient had a non-obstructive pattern, obviously at the MAGPRI scan, the uh, spontaneous uh, resolution were, 
who was much more, more, more frequent. And uh, if the age at presentation was a very early age, so uh, prenatal or perinatal diagnosis, this child, this, these children had a uh, much more like uh, spontaneous resolution. As far as continuous uh, antibiotic prophylaxis is concerned, uh, you can see here another study. And in this study, uh, they try to understand which group of patients could benefit more from uh, uh, continuous antibiotic prophylaxis. And the finding was pretty obvious, actually. Uh, it is that a patient with a dilation of the ureter greater than seven millimeters had a higher risk for UTIs, and so they benefit most from uh, continuous antibiotic prophylaxis for the first year, while patients who had a very mild dilation of the ureter, so uh, lower, smaller than seven millimeters, did not benefit. Let's come now to the operative management. So um, conventionally, the operative management has been divided into two uh, great chapters. The first chapter is a temporary management, which takes place when the patient is younger than uh, one year. You can ask why. There's, a, there's some debate on, on this, but uh, most pediatric urologists uh, still believe that uh, uh, patients younger than one age should not or could not, in many cases, uh, go directly to a surgical treatment, which is the ring plantation. This has two main reasons. The first reason is that uh, uh, it's believed that you risk to, uh, to do an extensive dissection of the bladder, and so you uh, risk to denervate the bladder. And the second is connected with the first, and is that uh, in, the, in the first years of year of age, they tend to have a very small bladder. And so it may be uh, rather difficult to have an appropriate uh, uh, subnucleosal tunnel for the prevention of the reflex, secondary reflex. And so if you need to do a very long tunnel, you risk, again, to uh, do a, an extended dissection of the bladder. And so you risk more on the side of the, the innervation or bladder dysfunction. There is discussion on, on this. We can discuss on this later, probably, but it's still uh, the current practice in uh, most centers, I believe. So the indication for temporary treatment, uh, UTI, obviously, breakthrough UTIs, despite the use of uh, antibiotic prophylaxis. Symptoms, which are rather rare, actually. Uh, the presence of a massive uh, dilation with uh, an impairment of the uh, result of the renal scan, the impairment of the renal function, usually below uh, 40%, rapid worsening of the dilation or rapid worsening or and or rapid worsening of uh, the uh, renal function of the affected site. Well, if we uh, talk about the definitive treatment, we can be uh, somewhat more liberal. So uh, we usually consider the persistent of uh, persistence of ureteral obstruction that we have defined before or and or the presence of symptoms and or complication which usually are uh, infection pain or the development of, of, of stones so temporary treatment conventionally conventionally has been uh, the, the diversion external diversion, the diversion with the use of a cutaneous stoma, so a ureteral cutaneostomy, uh, which, as you know, is a pretty easy intervention, a pretty fast intervention, which can be done easily also in very small child. It's not always uh, well accepted by the family. The problem is the presence of the cutaneous stoma, so from the from a practical standpoint, it's not a great problem because uh, you can do a ureteral cutaneostomy below the line of the diapers. 
okay so the children can have only one diaper and have the micturition from the from the penis or, or from the vagina but from the urethra and uh, the micturition from the urethra in a single diaper so from the practical standpoint i do not see it very as a as a great problem but from the psychological implication it could have uh, on the patient it could be a problem and the other the alternative surgical uh, intervention is a full channel reflexing reimplantation so you uh, do not try do not even try to do a submucosal tunnel to do a, an anti reflex uh, reimplantation you simply anastomize full channel the ureter to the blood this is preferred in cases of single kidney obviously and also in case of bilateral cases why because you do not want in these cases to uh, leave the bladder without the urine input because the urine input input is fundamental for a correct development and the increase of the size of the bladder this is the main reason the second reason is obviously the acceptance from the from the families and we have also a minimal invasive or endoscopic intervention so in case of unresponsive uti so in the urgent or emergent setting you can put a nephrostomy tube nephrostomy tubes in these uh, very small uh, children are not well accepted they could be a problem because the, the rate of uh, displacement or infection of the nephrostomy tube are very are very high so it is the last resort if you cannot manage an unresponsive uti in another way you can do a simple double j stenting the problem with the double j stenting are numerous several because uh, it's not always uh, uh, easy to catheterize the ureter because the ureter can be very tortuous so the possibility to have a damage of the ureter is not uh, completely to rule out and uh, the other problem is the infection that can develop and obviously it double j stenting alone is not a treatment actually of the disease is just a temporizing measure and then there's a, the possibility to do an endoscopic pneumatic dilation of the distal ureter that could be seen as we will discuss more in detail afterwards can be seen uh, as a two-phase two -face procedure so it's uh, it could be seen as a bridge or a temporary measure to allow the children uh, to grow and to undergo a def definitive treatment such as uh, uh, surgical reimplantation but in many cases could also be a definitive treatment here's a, an article about uh, reflexing ureteral reimplantation so direct ureteral reimplantation you see the average age of these uh, children was uh, uh, five months and uh, the most most of them underwent uh, reimplantation with the tapering or plication after one year of age but there are also also some patients who did not need uh, uh, tapering or there's also one patient who did not undergo any treatment actually when we're talking about uh, definitive treatment we know that still today the gold standard is ureteral reimplantation after the first year of life and the goals are several the first goal is obviously to remove the obstruction the second goal is to avoid an anti uh, to, to i mean sorry to, to create an anti-reflex mechanism so you must respect uh, the conventional ratio between length and diameter of the tunnel which is five out of one so one is the diameter and five is the length and uh, also obviously to avoid the iatrogenic damage to bladder innervation so to avoid bladder dysfunction after the reimplantation we have many choices here uh, so as far as isolation of the ureter is concerned you can do it extravesically uh, this allow better visualization of a tortuous ureter but obviously there's much more uh, extravesical dissection so you can increase the risk 
of uh, bladder dysfunction. While with the intravesical isolation, you can do bilateral isolation with a single incision, and the procedure is less invasive from the uh, bladder standpoint. Um, as far as tapering is concerned, you have uh, options. So you can do a plica the application, which has less risk of compromising vasculature, or a tailoring, which of which is applied uh, usually to a uh, usually dilated ureter or, and or to ureter with a very thick wall. And then you have some options regarding ureterovesical anastomosis. So you can do it extravesically, it's a Lich Gregoire technique, or intravesically as a polytunneled better or a coen. And then you need to, to choose if to do a blood abscess itching. So you see here, this is a typical intravesical isolation of the ureter. You can see on the on the right, a hugely dilated ureter and the uh, final stenotic uh, tract. And also on the left side, you see uh, another ureter with the stenotic uh, stenotic uh, terminal tract. And here on the on the right, you see the extravesical approach. So the ureter has been disconnected from the bladder. The bladder has been retracted laterally and you isolate the ureter. So usually this is done when you need the more extensive isolation towards the, the upper part of the, of the ureter. Tapering. Tapering can be done in many ways, but three uh, conventional ways have been described. So we have the Kalichinsky application seen here on the, on the left. You have the star palliation, which is uh, the most used in our center today. And then you have the hand drain tailoring. So you uh, actually use the, uh, the scissor to take out a part of the ureter and you do a suture to put it together. Brain plantation. Lich Grigoire is an extravesical extra technique. It's rather easy. It does not change the ureteral position, but the disadvantages can be that you uh, usually have a short tunnel. Polytunnel is better, is the most used also today for the open implantation. It has an intravesical approach. It has some advantages that you can obtain a long tunnel and you do not need to change the ureteral position. So you uh, do a, a tunnel and then you anastomize the ureter to the mucosa in the same place where it was before. It is more, somewhat more complex. So the most complex uh, part of the operation is probably the extra ves vesicle passage of the ureter from within the bladder. So it's a part that uh, requires more uh, experience and uh, it is more prone to kinking if not done, done properly. And then you have the, the coin technique. The coin technique is the classical intravesical transtrigonal technique. You can obtain a stable tunnel and it's undoubtedly easier for bilateral cases. Uh, but the disadvantages are that you obtain a uh, you can obtain a relatively short tunnel, but the most uh, common disadvantage is that it changes the ureteral position. So the right ureter comes out uh, in the bladder on the left side, and uh, so this may be a problem when you need to catheterize in a retrograde fashion the ureter, for example, for the treatment of a stone or for another procedure, and another urological procedure on the upper tract. Well, the procedure, why? Because it increases the length of the tunnel, because it can increase the stability of the tunnel, and most important, probably, it avoids, it can avoid the ureteral kinking when the bladder is full. Which approach? Most surgeons still are doing it uh, in the open fashion, especially in the younger child, children. So we can discuss this later, but today we have other options. 
and we have uh, some series uh, of uh, urethral reimplantation done in a minimal invasive way, so uh, laparoscopic and also robotic way. Here is, a, is an Italian study which was published this year on the um, robotic uh, reimplantation. You can see they did uh, a comparison, small, small numbers, obviously, so 11 robotic and 12 open, and they did not see any difference in operative time, success rate, and complication. The only difference were in favor of robotics in terms of hospital stay and cosmetic results. What should be noted in this article is that the median age was uh, rather high. So it was 38 months for the robotic and 46 months of the open. So it's doubtful that uh, the findings of this study can, ap can apply to the average mega ureter patient of uh, one year, one year and a half. Same here, so this is another, another study about uh, robotic uh, reimplantation. You can see that also here, the median age was 32 months, so rather, rather old, but the range can go, it's uh, very wide. It, can, it goes from six months to uh, 15 years. Mean operative time was rather long, and they did not see many significant complications. The curious thing is that uh, the only significant complications were related to drains. So they had a, a retention of a drain inside the abdomen, which required a, a surgical intervention, and uh, a problem with the, with the wound where the bladder was placed in another patient. And they have a delay of the closure of the wound. And the same is true for laparoscopy. So uh, you see here that uh, robotics performs well, performs better than uh, laparoscopy when it comes to uh, surgical reimplantation, as it is true for many, many surgical procedures in urology, but uh, not only in urology today. The outcomes are rather good. So the success rate uh, of the definitive uh, surgical treatment uh, are higher than 90, 95%. You obviously can have some complications. One, complica one possible complication e complication is a secondary reflex, urethral stenosis, obviously. The kinking, we've mentioned the kinking of the distal ureter, especially if the uh, dissection and the reimplantation of the ureter is not done properly. You can have risks of vesicle dysfunction. You can have uh, urinary leakage in the postoperative uh, period. What we need to understand here is uh, uh, that there's no much evidence about the very long-term outcomes. So what we're trying to put together is a serious data collection about the very long-term outcomes of this uh, procedure. So we need to understand not only the results in children, but also the results of the uh, children who have been reimplanted re when they become adult. What about endourology? Well, mm, endourology has several options for the treatment uh, of the obstructive mega ureter. They've been summarized in this uh, review that comes from 2016. 17, sorry. So the main approaches uh, can be cystoscopy and simple placement uh, of a double J ureteral stent, which is not actually a treatment, but it's more a temporizing uh, maneuver, temporizing measure to uh, a definitive uh, treatment, so like a bridge. You can do an incisional, so the incision of the uh, distal ureter and then place a double J. This has been done in 30% uh, by about 30% of the studies in this review. review. But the uh, most common uh, approach nowadays is the high pressure balloon dilation and the double J stand placement. And this, is, this has been done in 50% uh, of the studies uh, uh, included in, in this review. 
you can see when putting all these together in this review, so double J, retroautomy plus double J, high pressure dilation, you have uh, a uh, uh, success rate which is not so good because the uh, need for secondary procedure was uh, very high, about 37%. But obviously, the, the main limit of this uh, systematic review is that they included also many patients who did not receive uh, the treatment as a definitive treatment. So you cannot uh, draw conclusions, conclusions on endourology based on this uh, uh, study. What most centers are doing today, and we are also starting to do, is uh, pneumatic dilation. Is a procedure performed uh, with a high pressure dilating balloon. You can see here the balloon. You can see the pump which is used to fill the balloon. And the balloon is passed under cystoscopic and uh, radioscopic guidance over the obstructions obstruction over the uh, distal ureter and then uh, what you do is to fill the balloon with contrast at high pressure you reach uh, from the range from 10 to 16 atmospheres and you see here on the on the left that you have uh, a ring which is the stenotic tract you see the, here the progressive release of the ring, and you see here, you see like a sausage, which means uh, that uh, the uh, stenotic tract has been completely dilated. This is what most, center, most centers do today. So we try to understand by doing uh, an original review of the literature, a systematic review of the literature, which is uh, in publication, uh, we try to understand uh, how do the patients do. So we found a, a number of studies and uh, all the studies were retrospective. The number of patients included in the studies uh, was uh, very various from 10, 12 to uh, 73. And also what you observed is that the median age of, of a, a treatment was very, very, very scattered in this, uh, in this series because you go from uh, four months in some studies, nine months in other studies to uh, 3.6 years in other studies and even seven years in other studies. So it's very difficult to uh, draw any conclusions about the appropriate median age for this kind of treatment. The other problem is the way they report the result. So in some studies, they report 100% result, which is rather critical, I believe, because I haven't seen much procedures in, uh, in, in surgery that have 100% uh, uh, of uh, success. And the main problem here is how they define the success. This is one problem. The other problem is that how they include, how they choose to do the treatment. So you have seen uh, that uh, uh, more than 80% of these patients go to a spontaneous resolution. So obviously it's very hard to understand if you are treating the patient that you would have re-implanted or you are treating more patients because the treatment is less invasive. And then as far as complications are concerned, you see here that uh, they didn't have uh, many complications, but the most common uh, complications were infections. So UTI, which were uh, strictly connected with the uh, placement of the WJ stent uh, after the procedure. You see some studies showed up to 25 to 20% of UTIs. So whatever you do in these patient, patients, you need to have an extended follow-up. How do we do the follow-up? There's a, not so much consensus on it, but 
what we do is uh, uh, to have an early ultrasound after two months after treatment and also in untreated case to reevaluate the patient after six months with the clinical evaluation, ultrasound, and the dynamic renal scan, and then yearly for five years to have a clinical evaluation and ultrasound. And we tend to do a dynamic uh, renal scan again uh, at puberty because this is the uh, most critical part of the, of the follow-up because they can have uh, sometimes an unexpected uh, uh, worsening of dilation and worsening of the function when they, they enter the puberty. In case of UTI, obviously you should consider based on the clinical context to do a cystogram if needed and to do if uh, appropriate a DMSA, so a static uh, renal scan. So the message here is that no matter what you do, but these patients need to be followed very strictly. So for non-operative treatment, what we tend to do is to follow them, to, to follow them uh, uh, with the ultrasound at uh, three months, six months, nine months, and one year after they enter the follow-up, and also to repeat a dynamic uh, renal scan after six months, which is pretty much what we also do in uh, operated patients. So it doesn't change much. The, the problem is that you need to follow them very strictly. So thank you. I passed uh, again to Mariangela for wrapping it up uh, and providing some uh, take home messages. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Alessandro. So I wrap it up uh, this. Um, review of the current evidence and um, um, also some of our personal indications about treatment of uh, primary obstructive mega ureter. So it is a rather uncommon finding. The diagnosis is based on three specific exams, ultrasound, voiding cystogram, and um, sequential MAG3 scan. Okay, with conservative treatment um, and antibiotic prophylaxis, prophylaxis, resolution is possible in more than 80% of cases. So we need to keep this in mind. And I would like to add that these patients need to be followed up long term. This is very important. Gold standard of treatment is surgical reimplantation in the cases that we think need active treatment, okay? And we have seen the different options. And here I would like to add that meticulous technique, it's crucial to have success in ureteral reimplantation because it is a very it's difficult surgery and needs to be done in the proper way. And small details can be very important. And I would like also to say that principles of pediatric urology, surgical principles can be and should be applied also in adults when we do reimplantations and uh, we know how details are important in these techniques. When we think a non-surgical technique, technique, we, ten, we can um, think at endoscopic dilation and um, this is uh, possible non-surgical mini-invasive treatment it is promising. Uh, it needs standardized indications and also here we need long-term follow-up data and comparative studies before we can draw definitive conclusions on this um, mini-invasive and non-surgical alternatives. Again, we would like to stress that long-term follow-up is key for patients treated with non-surgical options, patients treated with surgery, and also for patients treated with conservative uh, treatment. So long-term follow-up, and we hope we will be um, able in the next future to gain our own data or long-term follow-up of these patients and, and possibly share them with you. And with these take-home messages, we 
we leave you. We thank you very much uh, for your attention. And, uh, and yes, we are ready to take questions if there are any. Thank you. Okay, that's the end of the uh, presentation. So I'd invite people now to, uh, so some people have sent questions in already, thank you very much. Um, yeah, if anyone else wants to ask a question, please do so now. Um, we've got about probably five, 10 minutes to go through these. Uh, hi, Marianne, thank you for putting your camera on. Um, Alessandro, I don't think we can see his camera today, but he's on audio hopefully still. Um, Marianne, have you got the questions I've sent through to you? Can you see them? Oh, Alessandro is there, I think. Great, there he is. Hi. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if you yes, that and do you want to go through them? Um yes, Darren. So I see the fair the, the I got one question. Um yeah, so the question was about uh, mainly the role why? of uh, retrograde systogram. Okay, so they ask in why would you like to do a retrograde histogram in all these patients? So uh, what we try to provide is a, a general guidelines for significant cases. And I do agree that in some mild cases, asymptomatic cases and so on, you can skip retrograde uh, histogram because there is no point in uh, diagnosing, for example, a low-grade reflux in, in all these patients. So I think in this specific setting, which is the setting of primary obstructive megaureter, the role, the main role of uh, uh, the uh, retrograde histogram is when the retrograde histogram is negative for reflux, but you have a significant dilation of the ureter and of the upper tract. Okay, I was just trying to find that question, okay. Alessandra. I can. <laughs> um, okay. Then I, um, I see one question. Another question is asking what size ureteric dilatation catheter you use? Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't have uh, really an extensive experience on this, but we've done some cases. And what we've done is to use uh, an angiocatheter, so the catheter which is routinely used uh, for endovascular procedure. And I'm not sure I can give you the uh, commercial names, but uh, we are using a five, a five French body with uh, a uh, four to five millimeter diameter of the balloon and two centimeters of length. Okay, there is another question written. Uh, it says, do you use a standardized hydration scheme for your ultrasound? Hydration scheme? No, there is actually no uh, standardized scheme. It means so that we use, I think uh, if we do. We use a free hydration, we encourage the hydration, but we don't have actually a standardized protocol for hydration. Right. Okay, then there is another one. How do we observe blood dysfunction in children with mega ureter, both surgically and conservatively treated? If he's asking if we perform blood capacity studies and euroflow in these children, you mean routinely? Routinely, in, in, in all patients, no, we are not doing this. This is a nice, a very nice uh, suggestion because uh, I believe and we believe that uh, there is no conclusive evidence on that. Okay, so a study uh, comparing treated and, and non-treated patients in the long term could be could be useful, I think. Yes, especially in cases where uh, an extensive dissection of the bladder has been performed. Yeah. I think it's crucial to do these sort of studies. Yeah, that's a very nice point, in fact. Okay, then we have how can be explained this for how can be explained the spontaneous resolving of primary obstructive mega yeah, this, is, this is more a philosophical question. Um, so uh, it's a smart it question. Be, yeah, yeah, it should be connected 
with the pathogenesis of the disease. So we feel and we know that the pathogenesis of disease is probably connected uh, with the, an aperistaltic segment. So in some cases, there is a, there is a mild obstruction that with the maturation of the, of the system, of the muscular fibers, of the connective tissue is with holdings, while in other cases is, uh, is, going to, is going to get worse. So the good question here could be, how can we select the patients uh, in terms of uh, likelihood of spontaneous resolu resolution? I don't think we have a definitive, uh, definitive answer on that. I think that both clinical and also histological and probably molecular uh, studies will provide us an answer in the next years. Yeah, it will be very nice to to sort to sort them out these patients who, or, or to sort out the patients who don't resolve. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The last the last question: Do you yourself perform endoscopic dilatation treatments? And what are your indications? Yeah, so uh, as I told you, it's not uh, routinely done in our center because uh, conventionally in our center we've done uh, uh, cutaneous stomas under the age of one and uh, reimplantation after the age of one. So this was our, our general practice. I believe that you can use it in uh, two ways, and we are using it in two ways. The first way is uh, as a bridge to a definitive treatment. So let's say you have uh, a, a child you feel is too young uh, to receive uh, a reimplantation. You could do a, a dilation, and if it works, it could be a definitive treatment. If it doesn't work, properly, it's still a bridge to a definitive treatment at an older age. And this is what we are, we are doing today, actually. So we are doing it uh, mainly in young children, so below the age of one, as a tentative of definitive treatment and or bridge treatment. OK. I, I think we we have gone through all the questions. I think there's, well, there are some more. I think some to you, Alessandro, as well. I think you, you can see. I don't think you can see the Marianne for some reason, but sent, I don't think you can see them, Alessandro, or not. I can read them out if not. So I can try to read them out. Um, sure. This one says, um, if an infant with progressive HUN has about 10% split renal function in DMSA Mag3 scan. What should be the next steps? So the function of the affected side is 10% or you are losing 10%? I don't get actually. So it has about 10% split renal function, that's what it says. So. Mm. Yeah, I think a treatment could be an option in this patient. So I don't think uh, demolitive treatment uh, should be the first option in this patient. So I still think that uh, treatment of the mega ureter with either uh, dilation or implantation could be a good option. Okay, um, another question. It says, for, for very small babies, introducing the angiocatheter is sometimes hard. In those yeah. cases, <laughs> we, we have- It is. <laughs> we have, they said in those cases, we have postponed dil dilatation and only introduced a size three ure ureter catheter as a temporary stent and then tried later. Have you encountered similar problems and what has been your approach? Yes, as I've told you, uh, we don't have that much an extensive experience, but still you feel that in very young children, this could be a, could be a problem. It could be a problem both catheterizing the ostium and uh, putting a guide wire through the ureter. So uh, I think this uh, this could be nice uh, suggestions. Okay, um, so that's all the questions we've got. Um, so let's give people like one minute to ask anything else. Just while I say uh, thank you to everyone, Sarah, Sarah says thank you for that, by the way. Um, so uh, I've answered. 
Um, so thank you everyone for joining today. If you, um, we have one more webinar in our series uh, until we have a summer break. Um, so that's next week. We'll have, a, we'll have to take August off until we restart in September. All the sessions upcoming will be put on our website. So do check that out uh, to find out what's, what's coming up. Um, so this webinar has been recorded. So it will be available after uh, this session ends and we'll send links tomorrow to everybody towards the kind of slightly edited version. Um, uh, so it will move straight into the webinar tomorrow. Um, other than that, I'd like to say um, thank you very much to uh, Mariangela and Alessandro today uh, for the presentation and for answering all those questions as well. Um, and say, um, I hope to see you all, all again soon. So to say thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Take care all. Thank Have you. a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.